Welcome to the 220th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Today is a discussion of virus evolution with biologist Justin Meyer. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. And I just want to underline that we do get really great suggestions from people who view and listen to COVID calls. So please keep those coming. As of today, February 15th, 2021, there are 2,405,339 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 485,943 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States. South Korea reports 1,527 deaths. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is paleobotanist Brian Axsmith dies. This appeared in The Scientist, June 3rd, 2020, and was written by Claire Jarvis. Brian Axsmith, a paleobotanist at the University of South Alabama, who discovered many significant fossils in the southeastern United States, died May 5th from complications associated with COVID-19. He was 57. Axsmith was born in Stowe, Pennsylvania, and raised in suburban Philadelphia. His sister, Doreen Axsmith Inman, told Fox 10 News he had a love of dinosaurs and paleontology from an early age. In an email to the scientist Timothy Sherman, a biologist at the University of South Alabama in Mobile, said Axsmith specifically became interested in Mesozoic plant fossils after finding them near his hometown in the Newark Basin when he was an undergraduate student. Axsmith received a bachelor's degree in biology from Millersville University of Pennsylvania and a doctorate in botany from the University of Kansas in 1998. Following postdoctoral training at the same institution, Axsmith took a job at the University of South Alabama in Mobile in 1999, where he was a professor of biology until his death. He had been doing a lot of work reinvigorating paleobotany down in the southeastern U.S., where some of the last publications had come out in 1918, Dana Eret, a curator at the New Jersey State Museum, told the scientist. Eret says, Axsmith rediscovered some of these old fossil sites in Alabama and Mississippi and resumed excavating them, discovering new specimens and species. His research focus was Pliocene flora from the Citronelle Formation local to Mobile. Some of Axsmith's most significant discoveries included the fossilized pollen and needles of the eastern white pine in Alabama and Mississippi. Currently, the species is only found in the northeastern United States and Canada. Axsmith also uncovered the earliest known post-Eocene fossil record of ironwood trees in North America. Axsmith also discovered fossilized wingnuts in the Citronelle Rock Formation in Mobile County, Alabama. Present-day wingnut species are only found in Asia, but Axsmith's find indicated that the species once existed in the southeastern United States as well. In 2019, a genus of plant fossils, Axsmithia, from the Triassic of Antarctica, was named in his honor. Eret recalls the infectious enthusiasm with which Axsmith performed fieldwork. Working with him out in the field, he was a big guy, but he would be swinging a pickaxe over his head for hours on end, pulling all these fossil specimens out of the sediments. You could see that childlike fascination with him. Students at the University of South Alabama, where Axsmith taught evolutionary biology, Remember him as a fun and engaging lecturer. He challenged you to think, regardless of what you thought about evolution. He's one of those, if I could just sit there and listen to him for hours on end, I would do it, 
He was very intriguing. Charlie Crabtree, a former student, told Fox 10 News. Jack Smith is survived by his wife, Jennifer, son, Jeffrey, and sister, Doreen. Okay, I'd like to turn to my discussion today. Let me introduce my guest, Justin Meyer. He is Associate Professor of Biology at the University of California, San Diego. He currently, he received his PhD from Michigan State University and was a Systems Biology Departmental Fellow at Harvard Medical School, where he was awarded the James S. McDonald Foundation Fellowship for Studying Complex Systems. He joined the Faculty of Ecology, Behavior, and Evolution at UCSD and the Quantitative Biology Initiative in 2014. His lab studies changes to viral genomes, which allow them to infect new species. He also considers the natural processes, including mutation, recombination, and natural selection that permit their evolution. Justin Meyer, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID calls today. Thank you, Scott. This is uh, a great honor. So I'd like to start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic is looking like there today. <clears throat> So I am calling from my house in San Diego. Uh, like you said, I, I'm a professor at UCSD. Um, the pandemic uh, in Southern California in the last couple months has been uh, pretty bad. Uh, in the last couple weeks, it's been a lot, lot better. Um, so there are lots of reports, especially up in LA, that the ERs were being filled and that people had to scramble to move patients around to other hospitals or create uh, more space for COVID-19 patients. Um, and so it was looking pretty dire. Uh, after the holidays, things have calmed down. Um, there's a lot of natural immunity in, in the population uh, and people are back to being, um, uh, taking more careful measures to combat the, the spread of the disease. And so uh, the numbers are dropping. And so I feel much better than I did maybe even just a month ago. Um, UCSD has a great medical infrastructure. So San Diego uh, wasn't hit as bad as LA. Um, we have lots of testing down here and um, yeah, things are going relatively well, but of course this is uh, uh, terrible for, for almost all areas of the world. So, One of the things that was um, impressive and scary, I think, to a lot of people last year was the, not only the pandemic, but also in Southern California, the wildfire um, concerns that you have. So, I mean, you made it through this pandemic and also wildfire season, and, and it won't be too long from now that you'll be worried about that again. Did that impact your your work or life there at UCSD at all, the, the wildfires of the, of the summer? Yeah, so um, uh, the wildfires don't impact us that, that much. Uh, so they, they tend to be uh, a little bit away from the coast. Uh, the university is right on the coast and so is the city. Mm -hmm. uh, I live in the city and so um, it's it, things would have to go very badly uh, for fires to ever reach sort of where, where we are. Um, but it does impact sort of the broader psychology of the region. And, you know, it's like you're, you're dealing with a pandemic, you're dealing with uh, social unrest, you're dealing with lots of problems. Uh, and then added on top of it, you get wild fires and things like that. And so, um, it does depress my students and my um, employees that work in the lab and so forth. And so it can be, it was it was very rough. I have friends that live in Northern California. Northern California, you get these forests so that when wildfires um, happen, they can, they can um, burn much brighter on all of the, you know, the, the wood and the forests. Down here, we don't, we don't, it's very much a desert and so, there are plants and there are wildfires, but it's not quite, it, they don't generate the same heat and the same mm -hmm. impact as in the Northern California. And in terms of getting back to campus, how's that looking right now? Uh, so luckily uh, my lab is up and running at one fourth capacity, mm. um, but but it's, it's one fourth capacity, but we can change our schedules and such so that it really is almost a hundred percent capacity. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, it looks like hopefully uh, enough people at the university will be vaccinated and enough people in this region will be vaccinated that um, the administration thinks that we might be back on campus, uh, not fully up and running, but almost fully up and running with uh, in-person classes and so forth in the fall. 
Um, but no one, that's sort of the earliest point that anybody's anticipating that. We're really hopeful, um, but it's gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to get through the summer and see how that all goes. We're gonna have to get through lots and lots of vaccinations. Um, you know, the rate is increasing. Summertime usually does mean that the conditions favor the virus going away, um, but it certainly did not go away last summer. So we'll see how that plays out. So we were chatting just a little bit before the call, and I, I told you that um, I grew up in Texas at a time in which biology textbooks still had a warning sticker on the outside that uh, uh, concepts like uh, evolution might be handled in this book. So I give that as a, as a way to start because I wanna, I'm going to ask you some basic things about science as we, as we get started. And uh, I don't want to misuse your time because you're an expert and we're going to get to the, the really cutting edge things your lab is doing. Is doing. But I, I hoped we would just start in a kind of basic way. You could just tell us what a virus is, why they're interesting to study. Can you start with that for us? Absolutely. Um, so a virus physically is kind of a ball of proteins. And inside that ball of protein is genetic information. Uh, that ball of protein is able to attach to cells and inject its genetic information. And then once that genetic information is inside the cell, it's programmed in a way that it takes over the cell. So you could think of it as being kind of like a hacker that gets into your system, gets into your computer. Now the, the computer is set up to you know do normal processes, but a hacker can take over it and make that computer do things for the hacker, steal your information and so forth. And that's exactly what a virus is doing. It is reprogramming the you know, network of proteins and other molecules inside the cell, telling them to not reproduce more of that cell, not to, um, to work in the interest of the cell, but instead to work in the interest of the virus. And so once that virus is inside, it then um, the cell begins to start producing more of that virus um, and uh, then the virus starts to break out of the cell. Often, so some viruses will actually kill off the cell in order to release the viral particles um, so they can spread to other cells. Um, or the virus can just sort of um, turn the cell into a factory that's just continually producing more viral particles. But often that factory runs at such a high rate, uh, basically overheats and the cell dies. Um, and so that's where, you know, where the damage comes in, why, why it begins to make us sick and even uh, causes uh, mortality. And uh, so, yeah, so you can think of that virus as just kind of this little tiny molecular hacker that breaks into your cell and convinces it to do, to not survive anymore, but to reproduce more of the viruses. In some senses, viruses are very simple, um, but they have all of this power uh, over the cell. And so there is some elegance to them and even kind of a beauty to them. Although, of course, I would I would like a world where we didn't have to worry about viral diseases. Well, I, w I wanted to ask you, because even the, the language you use there, I really like the, the analogy of the hacker. And I've called heard viruses called hunters before and parasites. Um, they must also serve functions that we might conceptualize as useful. Um, to the hosts or to living objects? What's the other side of the story? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of viruses are completely harmless um, and we never even detect that we're infected by the virus. Um, and more and more uh, virus research is pointing out that there's actually benefits to viruses, um, that they can actually improve health in different circumstances. Uh, a lot of these examples are not in humans as much as um, bacteria. So I study I study viruses that actually infect bacteria. We think of bacteria as being a disease themselves, but that disease gets its own diseases. So it has its own set of viruses. Um, and so we know in that that field of research that viruses of bacteria can have genes that enhance the um, the bacteria's ability to survive things like antibiotic treatment. Uh, so bad for us, but good for the bacteria. So it's kind of a weird mm -hmm. circumstance. Uh, they can have genes that help the bacteria survive, help the bacteria eat uh, resources, consume resources that it, it wouldn't normally be able to do. Uh, sometimes the, these genes uh, can influence the virulence of the bacteria, uh, which helps the bacteria survive uh, hosts uh, that it's infecting and so forth. Uh, so it's 
Um, viruses are certainly parasites. They depend on their host. They often take uh, resources away from the host and cause um, sickness or mortality, um, but they can also have beneficial effects. Is a virus alive? I know that maybe is like a metaphysical question, but I'm curious. Yeah, uh, a lot of people ask this question, and I, I, I maybe turn more into a lawyer than a scientist when I answer this question. <laughs> okay, I'm prepared. Um, <laughs> I'm married to a lawyer, so <laughs> all due respect to lawyers. Uh, uh, there's lots of things that feel alive. So cellular life replicates itself. That's alive, right? Everybody agrees that that's alive. Um, viruses, well, they need another cell to replicate. Uh, or they need a cell to replicate. And um, so that feels maybe that's not as, it's not um, as autonomous. And so it's dependent on a cell. And so maybe that's not alive, but it replicates, it has its own Darwinian fitness, it evolves, it changes, it has its own survival. And so, I don't know, that really feels alive. Um, and then you can sort of get even like more abstract than viruses. You can think about um, there are infectious cancers and so this is a cell line of cancer that goes from uh, not humans, but um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting the animal. Uh, Tasmanian devils hmm. uh, have this infectious cancer that goes from one devil to the other devil. Well, this is a, you can think of it as a cell that turned cancerous in one Tasmanian devil and then gained some kind of attributes so they could spread to another Tasmanian devil into another devil into another devil. And so, it's no longer um, reliant on its original, you know, Tasmanian devil that gave rise to it. It has its own kind of future. Um, and then you can think of cell cultures, right? So people often know about, know about uh, 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 cell cultures, uh, the lac cells um, that, you know, are growing in labs. So they're free of humans. They descended from a human at some point. But now they're, we can perform experiments on them. They're changing. They're growing in labs. And so they kind of have their own future and their own evolution. And so, mm. and there's even, you can think of memes as being alive. You can think of um, uh, uh, computer viruses as being alive because they replicate themselves and they're surviving in this, so, in, in, un, under all these different, in all these different platforms and all these different computers. And we don't know where they're going. They have their own kind of future. Um, and then if you go back to where we started, cellular life, uh, I certainly feel alive. And But one of the caveats for why viruses aren't alive is that they depend on cells to replicate them. Mm -hmm. But I depend on plants. I, if there were no, no other right. living or things in, in, in our biosphere, I would die. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of different flavors of life. Um, and I think the sort of common... Um, feature to all of these things is that life has its sort of own future, right? And it also has uh, an evolutionary process that allows it to adapt and change and to uh, improve through time. So, uh, given given that definition, then viruses are certainly alive. Viruses meet that test. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you you didn't sound like a lawyer. You sounded like a philosopher, but you also um, sounded a bit of an advocate for the complexity of of the virus, and I'm not surprised by that, considering that's what you, that's what you study, and that's the the case you make in terms of of your science. And I want to just to maybe go a little bit further um, with this and talk about SARS-CoV-2, talk about COVID-19. Tell us a little bit about what makes it unique, what you find interesting about it, some of the special features that set it apart from other kinds of viruses. So, okay. Uh... SARS-CoV-2 um, is the, the strain of virus that jumped into humans and started causing COVID-19, the disease. And um, what makes it unique? We're still trying to figure that out. The answer might actually be that it's not that unique, which is terrifying because that would mean that there's probably lots of other coronaviruses out there in nature that could eventually jump into human populations and cause a similar pandemic. This is also probably true for not just coronaviruses, but for influenza. Um, there's lots of different strains of influenza infecting swine, pigs, infecting uh, birds, infecting all kinds of organisms, and they can uh, potentially jump into our, our into humans and spread in the human population. Certainly, Ebola is a virus that continually reemerges in human populations. We call Ebola 
you know, there's a there's an Ebola virus, right? And that gives you the idea that that when there's an Ebola outbreak, it's that same virus. But actually, that's not true. Each time there's an Ebola outbreak, that's a that's a unique transmission from likely a bat to humans, and so it's a distinct virus. It's re- they're all kind of genetically related to each other, but it's a, a, a distinct emergence into human populations. So there's lots and lots of viruses out there, and lots of them probably have the potential to jump into human populations. And so um, we will figure out what's unique about SARS-CoV-2, but it probably is not very much. And it means that there's lots of potential other viruses that could do the same thing. So just like you were telling us at the at the start, um, maybe walk us through what happens when SARS-CoV-2 um, finds a host, when it begins to do its work. What, what happens? So uh, yeah, uh, it, um, uh, its first interaction, and so I'm going to give you kind of at the molecular level. Is that is that where you want the question? Absolutely, to go? Okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have you have this particle. Everybody's seen that CDC picture of the particle, that red with the big um, proteins. These are the, called the spike proteins. They're called coronavirus because it it looks like it, it's wearing a crown with all of these proteins on it. Um, those proteins are the proteins that detect um, host cells and attach to the host cell and trigger the infection. Um, Those proteins are also what the immune system recognizes. The reason for that is just that they're big and they're hanging off the the surface of the uh, viral particle. And so it's the easiest thing for the immune system to recognize. But getting back to say, say there's not an immune response and that the you're, you're a, a person that does, hasn't been vaccinated and doesn't have any natural immunity. Um, that viral particle finds a, a host cell, so finds one of your cells, um, probably in your nose or wherever it enters your body. Um, and it uses that spike protein and it binds to a protein on the outer membrane of our cells. That's called ACE2. So the cell uses ACE2 for its own health, but the virus takes advantage of ACE2. It binds to it, and then it triggers the infection process. There's a lot of complicated molecular interactions that take place, but what happens is it gets the RNA, which is its genome, its genetic information, is uh, stored as an RNA molecule. That RNA molecule comes into your cell, and once that RNA molecule is there, it then starts replicating more copies of that RNA molecule, but also it causes the cell to begin to create um, SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And so then the cell begins to assemble these different proteins, make that make uh, more particles of the SARS-CoV-2, pack in new copies of the genome so that, and then eventually the, the particles um, go to the outer membrane of the cell and kind of, I don't, I don't know the, the technical term, but they kind of like blip off, like they kind of, um, just take part of the membrane and pop off the pop mm-hmm. off the, um, the the cell, and then they can go on and infect other cells. I just want to remind everyone that you're listening to COVID calls, and I'm talking today with Justin Meyer, who's a biologist who studies viruses. You can get your questions in to the YouTube live chat. Just put them there in the chat, and you can also get your questions up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag at US of Disaster. And as you can see, Dr. Meyer is a science communication expert. And so um, any question about the sort of science behind viruses and the kind of work he does is totally fair game. And I, Justin, I really appreciate you taking me down the sort of biology 101 route there. I think it's really uh, useful, um, and particularly at various points. We hear so much about COVID-19 to actually come back to some of these sort of scientific principles just to understand it. And I, I want to go further with that now and ask you about your your laboratory, you wrote a really great article, I'm going to put it up on Twitter, um, in the conversation in 2018, in which you gave a bit of a clue about what you're interested in and what you do in your lab. And I just want to quote a sentence here. You said, to study the process of evolutionary innovation, researchers can use a technique called experimental evolution. Rather than trying to understand evolutionary events that happened in the past, experimental evolutionary biologists set up conditions in the lab where they can watch evolution happen in real time. I mean, my first question is, when can I come to your lab and see this this happen? It might 
might be a little while given COVID restrictions, but um, great piece and really um, exciting work. But can you talk to us a little bit about what that means? Like what kind, what does this research really look like? Yeah. So, um, uh, okay. Where, where to start? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's what I dedicate my life to. Um, so, uh, we do this thing called experimental evolution. And, and like that quote says, we culture viruses or you can culture bacteria or yeast, any kind of microorganism um, in the laboratory. And they have such fast rates of reproduction, so short generation times, that within days to weeks to months, even years, uh, you can run an experiment and actually see the organism evolve in action. So our experiments are usually only a couple weeks long, um, but we see that the virus that we study, bacterial phage lambda, we can talk about that a little bit more later, um, how that we can see that virus accumulate mutations, we can see it um, improve its ability to infect cells, we can see it uh, begin to infect brand new cells that it wasn't able to infect before, we can see it um, use new receptors, we talked about the ACE2 receptor, uh, so lambda phage uh, targets a completely different protein on a completely different organism, um, but we can see how it it evolves to use new receptors and hopefully learn principles about how viruses in general evolve to use two new receptors. So yeah, so in the lab, um, we we see evolution. We see it in organisms that we can change the conditions and see how it influences evolution. And so we can actually begin to perform experiments and test hypotheses about how evolution works. Uh, I was always interested in evolutionary biology as a kid um, and, and also as a, a university student, but I always felt the field, I was always a little bit frustrated by the science because it was impossible to imagine how to do experiments, at least for me at that point in my, my life, um, and to really test mechanisms of how evolution works. We would have to sort of rely on the fossil record and you know, making inferences from kind of flimsy data um, you know, obviously paleontological research is extraordinary. It's given us great insights into history, but it's not as good at informing us on the mechanisms of evolution. And so that frustration led people to wonder, you know, how can I actually perform an experiment? You know, that's different than like looking at pigeons like Darwin did or looking at finches like Darwin did, but actually, you know, perform an experiment. Um, and people came up uh, with the idea to culture microbes in a lab and to see them evolve and to use that as a platform in order to really probe mechanisms of evolution. Can you sketch out a little bit of the history of science with this? I mean, how long? Because when I think of, of evolution, it's exactly what you described. It's, it's um, of course, my reading of the origin of species and understanding, you know, uh, Mendelian genetics, and then you know, we we sort of know that history. Those of us who who take in history of science and and studied it, and I think about paleontology and the assembly of a rock record or a fossil record to understand, um, you know, changes over long periods of time. You're describing something a little different. When did scientists first begin to do this kind of work in the lab? That's a it's a great question, and the history was actually lost for a while, um, and the history actually dates back to, to Darwin's time. So Darwin had this amazing, beautiful um, theory and, and writing in the, on the origin of species. And it really fueled a lot of um, interest by lots and lots of biologists at the time. Um, and uh, there was a guy, and I think I'm gonna mess up his name. I think it's Dallinger. Um, was a part of you know the national or the the academy um, and was a, a a researcher that was studying protists and he thought huh what Darwin really needs is to see evolution in action and to perform some kind of experiment to show that natural selection will really will change an organism over time um, and that those changes are inher are are inherited and you know their evolutionary changes. Um, and so he was studying these protists that he had observed in a pond. He brought them into the lab. He could culture them into the lab and he created this machine that was slowly heating up the protists. And so he would increase the temperature ever so gradually through time until eventually the protists that were living in this contraption um, were adapted to much higher temperatures than the ones from, that he would isolate from the pond. And if he took those, those organisms and put them back at lower temperatures, 
they tended to, to perish. And so he wrote Darwin a note and he said, Darwin, I, I, I proved your theory with an experiment. Uh, it wasn't that clear of language. And unfortunately, Darwin kind of overlooked it. Um, at that time, you know, these, these microorganisms were not thought to operate at, with the same rules as uh, multicellular organisms mm -hmm. that were so complex. Uh, and so he just, he, he wrote back to Dellinger and, you know, said some kind words, uh, but never really keyed into the fact that he had set up an experiment to test his theory. Mm. And that, that idea persisted through the history of science for a long time that, that microbes were unique and distinct and played by different evolutionary roles. Um, and it wasn't until the 1950s when another famous uh, evolution experiment was performed by uh, this, this duo, Loria and Delbrook. Um, one's a microbiologist, one was a physicist, and they really led the formation of modern molecular biology. But they have a very famous experiment where they proved that genetic mutations in bacteria were random, that they, were not, they operated by the rules of Darwin and not the rules of Lamarck, who had this other idea about directed mutation mm -hmm. um, and so forth. Uh, and so after that experiment, then people thought of microbes as having random mutations and selection can act on those random mutations and that they are operating by very similar rules as the rest of uh, life. And so that's really set the stage for experiment evolution. Then you have this, um, this guy, Bruce Levin, uh, in probably the late 60s, 70s, still around, still doing great research, um, who uh, use microbial systems to test ecological and evolutionary theories. And that is when a lot of the sort of modern experimental evolution uh, began to be born. And you focus specifically on the bacteriophage lambda. Why, why that one? And I wonder if I could draw you out on as well, just you said that the entire experiment might be complete in, in two weeks. So sp speed is of the essence here, and you have to show that, that evolution um, is occurring quickly in this, in this particular format. But that seems very hard to me um, to do that, that work with that rapidity, and I guess to tie it back to the conditions we're living under right now. How have you been able to keep the lab going to do this? There's a lot of questions at once there. Take any part of it yeah. you want. But I'd like to know a little bit more about why you chose that particular um, you know, virus to study and how you've been able to maintain the speed. So I chose phage lambda um, in my PhD. Uh, I went to my advisor. I wanted to study a virus. Uh, I wanted to study how a virus co-evolves with its host. There's lots of questions about how organisms co-evolve with each other. It's a really complex complex subject because this thing's changing, then this other thing's changing, and that's affecting how this first thing changes, and it gets really, really intricate and really um, kind of messy, but there's beauty in that, that mess, and we need to figure it out. Um, and so because it's really messy, uh, I wanted a, a system that was very tractable, that we knew a lot about the virus already, we knew a lot about its host already, and that we could use things like um, sophisticated molecular biology tools to study the system. Um, so basically, I just wanted a, something that we knew a lot about and was experimentally tractable. And I went to my advisor and I said, okay, what best fits this? Uh, and he said, phage lambda. We've, we've been studying it for so long. It infects E. coli. We've been studying E. coli for so long. Um, and so that if you really want that kind of system, that's it. Now, people have said to me, uh, very famous people, that um, you shouldn't study phage lambda because basically everything's already been answered. Uh, that's, of course, really naive, even though it's from famous people, um, and not everything's answered. And my thought was, well, maybe we know a lot about the molecular biology, but we can use that now to understand evolution, that it hadn't, that there are a lot of unanswered questions in evolutionary biology that have, this organism had, hadn't been used to answer yet. Um, and so it was the idea that we could really push the frontier of evolution because we had all of this base of information. Well, just to stay with that, then what are some of the critical insights you've been able to, to glean from that? And I, I particularly like the, the aside you made that people tell you, now we know everything we need to know about, about this. That doesn't seem that doesn't seem possible or seem right. It seems like you've actually <laughs> taken that to the next level. So what, what are the unique findings about evolutionary processes that you're pulling out of phage lambda? So we have um, kind of have 
I would say there's kind of three big, so I, I've been studying uh, phage lambda for a little bit over a decade. Um, and there's kind of three big things that we've learned. Um, one is, is that we could evolve lambda to use a new receptor and that this evolution happened within weeks and it repeatedly happened under the right conditions in the lab. And at the time that we were publishing that work, it was being debated about, you know, how hard is it for viruses to be able to innovate in this way? Because if it was easy for them, then things, then viruses could more, could, then we should think of viruses and zoonotic transmission uh, in much more sort of dire ways than we had before, that it, 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 it could happen all the time. Um, and so that was before this pandemic. It, our discovery was not as depressing as it might be right now, um, but uh, it, we found that it was actually very easy for the virus to make these transitions, not nearly as difficult as former theory had, had suggested. Um, and so that was one of our key insights. Um, following up on that work, we uh, discovered why it was so easy. And so we discovered a new molecular mechanism for what allowed the virus to make, uh, to use a new receptor to innovate um, so easily. That, I guess in explaining that, I would get kind of in the weeds, but basically viruses can evolve proteins that multitask so that they can perform multiple different functions. And that is key to making a transition from one host to another, because you have to have proteins that can uh, facilitate infection and growth on one host cell, but also a new host cell. Um, and so that bridge is, is created by these viruses that are these viral proteins that can multitask. Um, the third thing that we showed is that viruses actually speciate um, just like cellular organisms do. And that um, for a long time, it was debated whether or not viruses you know, really obey the same principles. This is much like, you know, Darwin thought, oh, microbes aren't, aren't like cellular organisms. And then until very recently, we thought, oh, viruses are not like cellular organisms. They're not organized into these species. Um, but we showed in the lab that we could get our virus to speciate into two brand new viruses. Um, and then since then, people have looked back into uh, viral data and have analyzed them in ways to show that they do form what we call biological species. Um, and so that's a new frontier of research is trying to figure that out. And I would say that that was not, I mean, it's not entirely our group, but we had that sort of key study to say, to show like, look, this can happen. Um, and that was based on using this model system where we could manipulate things in ways that we could see, see what was thought to be impossible. And there's so much in what you just described and it's really fascinating. And I was thinking about some of the historians of medicine that I've been lucky enough to talk to in the last year. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Monica Green, who's interested in doing really deep history of pandemics. And these kinds of things that you're describing about the pretty rapid evolution of uh, microorganisms, um, uh, viruses in this case, um, helps us maybe go back and, I mean, the work can go both directions, right? I mean, it helps us understand how pandemics might have operated in the past, but it also seems like there's crucial insights for COVID-19. Can you loop it back to what you were just talking about, what, what then that illuminates for us and what we might expect in terms of how COVID-19 or how SARS-CoV-2 is going to change and how that's gonna impact the way it manifests itself in humans? Yeah, absolutely. So how does how does my, you know, uh, lowly research on Lambda uh, inform, you know, this this what we're seeing with the pandemic? Um, so I guess I want to uh, go back to discovering this new molecular mechanism for how diseases um, transition from one host to another host. Um, the way that those proteins become multitasking proteins. And so the protein that I'm specifically talking about is the host recognition protein. On Lambda, it's called J. Uh, on SARS-CoV-2, it's called Spike. Um, they serve the same function. They're not, they're not the same protein at all, but they serve the same function. Um, the way that we see that Lambda achieves a sort of multitasking ability is by destabilizing the protein so that it has kind of a, a more wiggly shape and can form into different conformations and then interact with different host proteins. And so applied to SARS-CoV-2, 
I would make the prediction, now this is not tested yet, but I would make the prediction that the SARS-CoV-2 that jumped into the human population would have a destabilized spike protein that allowed it to interact with new proteins on the outer membrane of its host and infect new hosts. Um, so there is a little data that support, supports this idea. What we showed in Lambda is that after it's able to use this new receptor, then it continues to evolve by uh, getting better at using that new receptor through mutations that stabilize a brand new conformation of the protein, fix that form of the protein. So now Lambda is unable to use the old receptor, but is really good at the new receptor. And it's much more stable, so it can survive in the environment for much longer. Uh, and when the first mutation, I forget which mutation it is, uh, but the first mutation in SARS-CoV-2 that was shown to be adaptive, um, improved its ability to infect human cells and improved its, it, it made the, the particle more stable. This led to the, the particle um, producing viral titers, so numbers of viruses from cell culture and, um, that were much higher. And so it just had all of these benefits um, for the virus, but it was it was just like these lambda these lambda mutations where it 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 stabilized the, the the protein, presumably the conformation of the protein, and allow it to better infect the new receptor. I don't know if there's a cost on the old receptor in bats that used to use, but probably. I'm listening to this, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, about the implications of that in terms of the new. Uh, strains we're hearing about that, and I think what a lot of people are concerned is that we spent all this time worrying about the vaccine development, which has been treated as a sort of magic bullet. Oh, well, there's SARS-CoV-2. It's a thing. We recognize it. We learn its its traits and attributes, and we learn how to neutralize it with the vaccine, and we're we're good to go. Pretty much everything you've just said tells me that that's not the right way to think about this. So I would have um, vaccines are very effective. Uh, the immune response that they trigger is usually um, very strong. Uh, it, they afford a lot of protection to that original strain, but usually um, strains, viruses have a difficult time to mutate enough to be able to avoid the immune response that vaccines trigger. Um, but it does seem, and I, at the beginning, uh, when I was teaching my class, uh, last year, evolution of infectious disease, um, I would have told the students that once we get a vaccine, we wouldn't have to worry about new strains because it would require so many mutations in order for the virus to resist that immune response. And we know that SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses actually have a relatively low mutation rate compared to HIV and compared to influenza. And so they just wouldn't have enough time to outrun the immune response. But I was completely wrong. It does appear that there are variants now um, that have emerged, especially in South Africa, um, that are able to not 100% avoid our immune response to the original vaccine and the original uh, strain of the virus, but they, are, they, are, they have some ability to, to avoid our immune, our immune response. Uh, the thing, the missing piece of the puzzle that I, I hadn't thought about uh, and what I'm about to say is not proven yet. It's a hypothesis, um, but it's one that I heard Dr. Fauci talk about. And I have a lot of respect for Dr. Fauci, so I, I, I'm out on a limb, but I think it's a pretty strong limb, um, is that uh, there are a lot of, uh, especially in South Africa, there's a lot of immunocompromised people that are infected with HIV. Uh, and in those circumstances, viruses can infect, you have an immune response, but it's not a very strong immune response. And so um, the virus is kind of continually getting punched by the immune system, but it's not getting knocked out. And that's a circumstance where it can then avoid those punches by mutating itself. And so you have the, the um, circumstance where it keeps sort of dodging these punches, dodging these punches, and eventually it's accumulated so many mutations that it's able to avoid a typical immune response um, to, to the virus. And so you get kind of the right circumstance where you get these stepping stones that allow the virus to evolve to avoid our immune systems. Um, so certainly uh, the immune system can relearn 
um, how to defend against this new strain of virus, but it it ha- it requires a new cycle of vaccination or a new cycle mm-hmm. of natural immunity and so forth. And we just want to deal with this once. So all of that being said, the vaccines have been shown to you know have a lot of protection even against this new strain of virus. But it, it's really interesting the way you, you talk about that South African mutation because maybe up in until pretty far into the 20th century, we might have expected um, those kind of mutations might be isolated somewhat. But globalization has changed that. And I wanted to ask you about this, you know, the impact of globalization on the way you think about um, evolution, viral evolution, but then also this issue of species to species jump, because that also seems somehow connected to climate change to me, the, that the ecosystems are changing, animals are coming into closer contact. Um, maybe there's, you know, humans are coming into closer contact with animals than they might um, not have been in, in the past. So, you know, based on my understanding of the way evolution works, we have to sort of co- conceptualize the entire ecosystem as well, um, which is super complicated. I, I don't know what you think about that, the sort of complication of globalization and, and changes to the global ecosystem and how they might be impacting what's happening with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, so I <clears throat> I teach this course, Evolution of Infectious Disease. And the first lecture, I, I've designed it um, in order to just get students excited about the subject. And one of the first slides that I, that I go through is how, why we've kind of created the perfect storm of conditions um, in order to help facilitate pandemics. Um, I started teaching this class six years ago, well before uh, we actually lived through a pandemic. It's much more depressing to talk about this, you know, this introduction now. Um, but basically, we have we have done a number of things. Um, and and I, these things, I don't think we necessarily have to reverse these things that we're doing. Um, but we do have to think about the potential pandemics much more and design strategies to combat, combat them much more effectively than we have, given that we've created these circumstances. So the, what are those circumstances? We live in really dense cities. And so that's important for this large global population to live efficiently. Cities are much more efficient than if you're, sprawl, if you're, if you're spread out. Um, but it means that transmission of a virus that's not very good uh, can, can still spread. And so when viruses jump from animals to uh, a new host to humans, they typically start out pretty poor at that. And then they can, if they can spread though, they can begin to accumulate mutations and spread faster and faster in those populations and take hold. Um, so that city, that city, the urbanization uh, does create a condition where, you know, the, the newly spreading virus can, can take hold and, and can adapt to us and then spread. Um, our encroachment on natural areas um, or these wet markets, for instance, the trade of exotic animals, what, what that does is it puts us into contact with um, organisms that we normally wouldn't be in contact with. They, those organisms have their own viruses. Those viruses have some potential to jump into humans. So it's just a numbers thing. The more you increase that contact, the more you tip the scales to potentiate a pandemic. Uh, the third thing is once you get that that epidemic in a city, it can then spread globally, creating a pandemic mm. uh, because of global travel. Now, global travel is good because you know it keeps us united and interacting with each other and so forth. We have to live together on this you know this this one planet, um, but it does have this this problem. Um, and also all kinds of other problems associated with increasing global warming and increasing the di- disruption of environments that then trigger pandemics and so forth. So, um, yeah, we have the modern world has created the perfect storm of conditions to, to cause a pandemic. What that tells you is that this is not a one and done thing. We are going to be plagued with this problem uh, into the future and we have to deal with it or come up with strategies to deal with them better. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls and talking today with Dr. Justin Meyer about viruses and evolution. And we're just talking about sort of the macro scale of things here that's made a perfect storm um, for this global pandemic. I want You mentioned your class a couple of times, Justin, and I want to 
first of all, I want to take that class. Uh, and second of all, I want to, um, you, you've been very active with your teaching at this time. And, and I really admire that, you know, uh, teachers, researchers who are at the cutting edge, who will also take the time to think about clear science communication outside the classroom, and then also what's happening inside the classroom. So talk a little bit about your, your path as a teacher over this last year. You're bringing a lot of students into, um, into this really important work. Most of them won't end up specializing like you do, but some of them will. How are you grabbing and keeping their attention? Yeah, so, um, okay. Uh, I teach this class, Evolution of Infectious Disease. Uh, I start teaching it at the, uh, I teach it once a year, at, and it starts at the end of March. And so when I taught it last year, that was right. So the middle of March is when we all started shutting things down and staying at home. And so at the end of March, uh, this was a very popular class. We had a, an enrollment of 350 people and it was all online. And actually all the videos are on YouTube. Although, uh, and the way that I, I uh, captured the students' attention and got them to really engage with the material is to discuss the pandemic we're going through, discuss the science um, that was happening in real time, trying to figure out how SARS-CoV-2 works, whether or not we could develop therapeutics, whether or not we could use existing therapeutics, um, predicting, you know, using what we know about disease transmission to make predictions for how fast this virus is going to spread and how much more morbidity and mortality was going to ha uh, have. Uh, impact the human population and and so forth so um yeah the, the class was it was um it was a a cool experience uh i uh i study viruses but like i said i study this virus that doesn't infect humans and i and i you know i think that our research does um inform how viruses like coronaviruses evolve and how natural selection works on them and so forth but our research itself doesn't directly uh, deal with the problem at hand, doesn't directly deal with the, the ongoing pandemic. We're not developing therapeutics and so forth. Um, and so I thought to myself that really my role uh, in, in helping people and helping uh, people through the pandemic was through teaching. Um, and so really dug in last year in thinking about how I could reach as many people as possible and inform them on what was going on. Um, I found with my students that having that information, while it wouldn't directly impact their health um, or their family's health, it gave them power over the subject and power over this crisis that everybody was going through. Uh, they could more easily make decisions about what to do and what not to do, or not even that. It has this sort of other effect on people's psychology that it just helps them understand what's happening and gives a little bit more certainty to to a very uncertain world at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, so I, it, it was a, a really great experience. So I wonder if we could say a little bit more about um, how you help the students cope with the uncertainty and the fear. I, I know you had an innovation in your class that you called temperature check. Uh, and you talked about your own health experiences a little bit just to kind of maybe demystify a little bit what's going on, but also to make it okay for people to ask questions like I'm asking you questions and to be afraid? Yeah, so I um, uh, the beginning of all of my lectures, we would we would go over the normal lecture material uh, in the class. Uh, I, I'd cut it down a little bit so that I could have a few specific lectures on coronavirus, but I also cut it cut the lectures down and the material down a little bit so that I could spend you know at least 15 minutes every class period, uh, discussing what was in the news, where the pandemic was heading, what are things that we should be concerned about? Um, you know, what are the the where are vaccine where is vaccine development? Um, we discuss things that seem absurd now. You know, the 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 uh, hydroxychloroquine um, that was debunked, but the president at the time was talking all about, and people had questions and even some hospitals in the San Diego area were stockpiling these chemicals that turned out to not have any effect on this, on, on treatment of, uh, COVID-19. Um, so we were just sort of working through the data and working through all of that. Um, in, in this day and age, we, um, we have a lot of, uh, freely available data on 
the the genomes of this virus and how the genomes are changing and how it's spreading around the globe. Uh, there are smart thermometers that people own that send data to a central depository, so you can see if you know there there tends to be more fevers in a population at any given time, and so you can sort of track all these things. And so that's what we're doing: the temperature check, um, working through the science, and trying to be as informed as possible. And so I think that that really helped draw the students in um, to the course and the material. And, and then I could reference back in the general lecture about how you know this really fundamental evolutionary process informs things that we had just talked about, whether or not um, certain treatments would drive the virus to be resistant to those treatments. And then we'd learn about you know the math behind how that, that works in microbial populations. Uh, so I, I, I think that really helped engaging. Um, but also, uh, I think, you know, we often build walls, uh, professors do with their students. And one, one and we have this digital wall that we all are experiencing right now. We're talking over Zoom and other platforms. Um, and so it's really important to break down those walls. And one way that I connected with the students very quickly and broke down this digital wall and the distancing that we're we all have to do um, is by sharing a, a medical problem that I had when I was their age. Um, so when I was a senior in college, I had an autoimmune response to the to influenza uh, where the uh, my immune system began to attack my neurons. And this caused me to become blind, paralyzed, unable to breathe. Um, so I was basically a vegetable that could hear in a hospital bed for over a month. And um, it obviously knocked me out of my last year of, of college. Uh, I've had a full recovery. Most people do that have Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, but uh, it was a huge disruption to my life. And um, it was very similar to what my students were going through in that they were, a lot of them, they're juniors and seniors. So a lot of them were in their senior year. And now they're, they're last semester together was completely upended. Um, and so they weren't gonna really have a graduation and they weren't going to have all the parties that they had planned on and they weren't, and maybe it made it harder for them to figure out the next steps. And so that's exactly what I went through. Um, and I could just help them uh, put that into perspective just because I had that, that, that same experience. Um, it's a powerful form of empathy when one shares one's own personal health experiences, things you might rather keep to yourself or not bring back up. How did the students react to that? Uh, I think they it, it really helped them just, I don't know, connect with me. And uh, I, I don't know, you feel like that shouldn't be uh, important for a student's learning and, um, but it is, uh, you know, they, it, you have to, you have to connect with people for them to want to listen and learn from you. Um, it helped them, uh, kind of put their own experience into perspective. Uh, it might have even shown them that, you know, things could be worse. <laughs> I mean, this is terrible and I don't want to minimize anybody's uh, experiences because this is, I mean, this is horrendous what we're going through in the last year. Um, but, you know, people through generations have dealt with hard things. And uh, the way that I got through it was to focus on my recovery, to set goals and to just really work at those goals. and. Uh, so I would talk to the students about how, you know, they sort of have to visualize a future beyond this um, and and set goals for their life after all of this. Um, and sort of what are the steps they can take now and in the future to get to to achieve those goals. And I think that focus just just helps anybody, but helps them, especially because they're at that transition point in life from university into into adulthood. We're almost up on time in my discussion today with Justin Meyer, but there's something you just said, Justin, that I really want to um, spend a few minutes with if we can. You talked about the, the power of a personal story as a way to make connection, um, but we're also doing it to build some common ground and trust so that we can teach and learn from each other. And, you know, that. Um, it maybe sometimes doesn't go further than that. We want, um, you know, to, to build a good rapport with our students. We want them to come away with a great learning experience. Fine. 
But you've also gone much further than that. I mean, by putting your lectures up on YouTube, you've entered into the public science communication space. And um, that comes with some risk these days. You know, we're living in a time, um, I mentioned before, those textbooks that uh, in the 1980s in Texas that had the warning sticker about the theory of evolution. This isn't the first time in American history that we've had pitched battles over science and what scientists are doing and how that has implications for society more broadly. But even I, who've studied the history of this, have been startled this last year by the resistance to science, by the vilification of scientists, by the amount of disinformation, and not just by fringe groups, but all the way to the president of the United States. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on your own journey there in terms of the courage to put the lectures up, but also what that's meant for you, and maybe more broadly, how you see the role of scientists as um, people who can demythologize, uh, who can bring some information against the disinformation that, frankly, has been costing lives this year, by my estimation. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know. I definitely don't have um, solutions to the disinformation and my own personal story um, in, uh, you know, trying to push for science education and um, to delegitimize these, you know, these um, conspiracy theories that are spreading um, is is just by trying to teach and trying to talk and so forth. I mean, I find it infuriating um, how much information is being spread. I don't really understand why people um, spend so much time buying into um, conspiracy theories rather than just learning the science, right? So like there's just, we scientists have done so much work and we know so much and there's there's so much that you can learn from from valid sources and and sources that you know I'm not telling you that that people have to go and read scientific journals but you know there's lots of popular science to learn about and there's so many cool things that you never would have imagined would be true but they are true and instead people are sort of watching these weird videos and buying into conspiracy theories and I I don't know how to push back on it besides just hopefully you know producing more content that's based on, on, on science. Um, my own sort of interest in evolutionary biology um, started when I was a young kid. I, I loved catching bugs and things like that in nature. I loved all kinds, I loved plants and animals and fishing and stuff like that. And I just always, it, it, I always marveled at all of this biodiversity. And then somebody told me about evolution by natural selection and all of like why a spider makes a web why you know organisms are so well adapted to their environment all of that began to make sense and so i felt it was really beautiful and then when i would tell people about it you know in the united states it's about 50 50 of whether or not people believe in evolution and you know people would argue with me and it it really i found it so infuriating because it had opened up my eyes and showed me this this way of understanding the world that i thought was really not just um informative but beautiful and um, and so that's actually why I got into experimental evolution is to to show people, look, things evolve in action. You can see them like this virus could not do this thing. And now it can. And just a matter of days. And here are the mutations that do it. Um, and so it was to kind of push back. Uh, and we have been in the the um, uh, we have uh, we uh, there's YouTube videos uh, arguing against our research. Um, there are there's articles written by intelligent design, uh, re, you know, researchers. Um, that's in air quotes if if you're not watching the video, <laughs> um, <laughs> because uh, you know pushing back on a research and because it's it's a threat to to um, uh, to this idea that they're trying to push. Um, it's an, an it's an idea that's based on not actual data, just an idea. It's something that they 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 wish were true. Um, and so I do have this history of, you know, I guess pushing back on, on, um, you know, intelligent design at least. And during this pandemic, it's been especially um, frustrating. You know, there's a, there was a video that was released during when I was teaching my class. So this is almost a year ago, uh, called Plandemic. And uh, I never watched the video. I just sort of heard about it, um, and I had questions students ask me questions based on this video and it was 
really disheartening to me that they were both taking my class and watching this video and thought, thinking that there were sort of valid arguments in this in this video that that this pandemic was not natural but it was sort of engineered or I I don't I'm just assuming based on the the naming pandemic that it was you know not a natural source right. um, it is it definitely is uh, and so I would have to talk to my students about you know that why what they were um, uh, talking about was wrong um, my parents uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago watched um, Bill Maher. Uh, and I haven't watched this either. I have I have this sort of repulsion from watching um, what I think is misinformation, especially about this pandemic. Um, but he had a segment where there were two scientists talking about um, that this was a virus that came from the lab. And my parents were really compelled by this and talking mm -hmm. to me about it. And um, they were you know, describing the arguments and I could tell that the arguments were completely off base. Uh, and um, just there are simpler explanations for the patterns that they were they were describing, and um, I, I just I, yeah, it's it's very disheartening. Um, so the way to fight it, just good information, talking to people, communicating. Um, it's I mean it's really it's it, we're we're in a weird time in history. Thank you for discussing that. At that, at that length too, I talked with Peter Hotez about this, and he, you know, he hit a lot of the same notes that you did. And it, it strikes me that it's just a, an entire additional job for you, um, that maybe uh, it might affect the way we think about graduate training, both in in medicine and in the sciences and in the social sciences that we can't take for granted anymore that the um, professorial rostrum is going to be accepted by all of our students as the unquestioned uh, center of knowledge in a subject area. I'm really moved by your description of students who might be watching your video in one tab, and then they open another tab where they can see a disinformation video, and they appear to be on the same playing field in terms of evidence. Um, you know, ordinarily, I think before this last year, I would have said, that's fine. Information's always out there in the system. Disinformation's always out there in the system. We have um, ways for people to find good information if they want to find it. Um, but the stakes were very high last year. And I, and I don't think they're going to get any less as we go forward. So it seems to add some additional urgency that scientists such as yourself have to really kind of get some chops in this science communication space and, and fast. Do you hear that kind of discussion among your your colleagues are are you unique in this regard? No, I, absolutely. Um, as soon as the pandemic happened, I I moved my course online um, and made it maybe made it available to everybody. Um, but also UCSD in the Division of Biological Sciences where I'm at, uh, we released a, a series of videos that were highly informative, um, a little bit more advanced in the science realm, um, but very good. Just trying to describe what was going on. Um, and there's been a series of those videos that UCSD has produced and other universities, of course, have, and you, you know, your podcast and every, you know, there's a lot of people have come to action um, to communicate these things. And I would say that generally, even before the pandemic, um, you know, our division has invested in hiring people um, for communications. People often think of that as being sort of self-promotion, but it's actually, you know, for educating the public and and for us to learn how to better communicate and talk to um, people that are not trained in the sciences. So, yeah, so I think that's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely talked about a lot more. And I mean, the nature of funding in the country too, uh, NSF puts a lot of emphasis on, you know, conveying your results and your research to the general public uh, so that we're not sort of isolated. Um, but I think there was a history of isolation and, and just sort of assuming that everybody would, trust scientists. I want to remind everyone you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls every weekday, 5 p.m. Eastern time. A little programming note, now that I'm uh, broadcasting from uh, South Korea, from Daejeon, South Korea, we will occasionally be having COVID calls episodes live at 5 p.m. Korea time, which is 3 a.m. Uh, East Coast time, uh, midnight, uh, Pacific time. So for late night owls in the West Coast, you'll be able to catch uh, my discussion live when I do those 5 p.m. Korea time episodes. But you can always catch COVID calls 
um, after the fact on YouTube Live and also on Periscope and Facebook Live and also as the audio podcast. Tomorrow is going to be one of those 5 p.m. Korea time episodes, and I'm uh, really excited to talk with Fiona Anciano tomorrow about the Lockdown Diaries project. So please do join me for that, and I'll make all this programming information available to everyone. And I also uh, want to thank Justin Meyer uh, for his time today. Uh, really, uh, for the ground we covered and and for the work you're doing and taking time to uh, so patiently describe it, um, your research is amazing. And and best of luck going forward, Justin. Thanks for this time today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow, 5 p.m. Korea time.